Hey, I'm Dawn Zigger. Welcome to Love After Divorce. Now, if you're listening to these episodes of Love After Divorce, then you want everlasting love, but you don't have it. You might say you haven't won the everlasting love lottery, and that sucks because everlasting love is a lot more fun than a life without it. And it's not, it's just not right when somebody who wants everlasting love doesn't have it because there's no reason that should happen. So I have good news for you. Finding everlasting love is not a lottery. It doesn't happen by chance. It happens because of you. You have the potential to have the everlasting love you want. The only issue is that you just aren't using your potential to its full extent. That's it. It's not rocket science. All it means is that your potential is just sleeping or being used in the wrong way. So we need to get all of your potential on board because everlasting love is a big issue. If it wasn't, we wouldn't have a million stories and movies about it. We wouldn't be so drawn to it. And since this is such a big life issue, it's good to find out how much control you do have because here's the deal. Either romance and love are hard and heartbreak and loneliness are just the way it is, or you have some influence over what's going on in your love life. And in case you didn't already know, it's the latter. So you have so much influence on whether you get your happily ever after or not. And that is the best news ever. But unless you do things differently, you're going to be stuck where you're at right now. You'll be stuck in a role you don't want to be in. The betrayed wife, the abandoned wife, the scorned woman, the woman who only attracts frogs or the woman who spends the rest of her life alone. And if you're wondering if this is important, it is. The desire for everlasting love isn't just some frivolous need. The desire is not stupid. People want this. Everlasting love is a worthy goal. It changes your life for the better and it changes the lives of those around you for the better too. So with the goal of everlasting love in our future, let's talk about our next sister of the unhappily ever after. In case you are just tuning in, these sisters are types of women who repel good men and attract frogs instead. Think of them as characters we play. And often women have characteristics of many of these characters. For example, one woman may embody characteristics from Powerless Polly, Desperate Debbie, and Passive Patricia. You can hear about these sisters, these characters in previous episodes. So feel free to check out earlier episodes too. So whether you're new to my Love After Divorce series or not, this episode will make sense because the sister I'll tell you about today lives inside many of us. Many women ask me about this sister, and I have been possessed by this sister more than I'd like to admit. Her name is Rosie. And like so many relationships, the beginning was great. When Rosie met Jake, she couldn't believe her good luck. She was in full-on infatuation mode. He was always on her mind. She couldn't wait to see him. And she relished coming up with things to do to make him happy. All those love hormones coursed through her body and she felt intoxicated. The relationship progressed, lots of dates. They met each other's families. They talked a lot about the future. So the relationship was moving forward. And Rosie thought things were going pretty well, not perfect, but Rosie told herself that that's the way relationships go. No relationship is perfect. You just have to put up with each other's quirks. She figured that people put their best foot forward in the beginning and then settle in. The real you comes out later. No big deal. Like the thing with tennis, Rosie loved playing tennis and she played tennis with three other women. They all worked full time, but got together every Wednesday and Saturday come hell or high water. In fact, this foursome had been playing tennis together for a decade. They all met in college and were like four peas in a pod. Two of them were married. One was a single mom and Rosie had a number of boyfriends come and go over the course of their friendship. Rosie introduced Jake 
to the tennis ladies early on. And at first, he thought it was great that she had such close friends to spend time with. But one Saturday afternoon, as Rosie was heading out the door, Jake made a comment. He said, have fun with the people you actually care about. She figured he was in a bad mood. But when she got home, Jake said, you seem more interested in hanging out with your girlfriends than me. And he thought it would be best for their relationship if she quit playing tennis twice a week with her friends. He thought twice a month was plenty. So she decided to limit her time with her girlfriends so she'd have more time with Jake. It felt off to her because she and Jake spent plenty of time together, but she just figured it was kind of sweet that Jake wanted even more of her. The tennis ladies were not happy and neither was Rosie's family. They had always known Rosie as a free spirit, but it seemed like every time they saw Rosie and Jake together, he controlled her. Like a few months ago, they went to a family reunion. Rosie's family has one every summer at a cabin on the Finger Lakes in New York. She and her two sisters planned to head out for a winery tour. She figured Jake could spend some time getting to know her parents better. Plus, Jake always had work to do, so he could always spend the day doing whatever he needed to do. But Jake said he felt really uncomfortable with her going to a winery without him. He was worried that men would hit on Rosie, and he wanted to be there just in case. So even though Rosie was looking forward to chick time with her sisters, she let Jake come with them. She just figured it was easier to do what Jake wanted. Plus, she told herself now her sisters would have more time to get to know Jake too. So that was that. Rosie figured her relationship with Jake was most important and that her family and friends would just have to understand. But privately, Rosie worried because her and Jake didn't always get along. It's like they had the same fight over and over again. Whenever she felt worried, she just recited a mantra. She simply told herself that no relationship was perfect and that she had a lot to be grateful for when it came to Jake. But there were some things Rosie did complain about to her friends when she saw them. She described things that Jake did that she would not put up with. Like the way he chastised her when she went out with work friends. Every quarter, she and her colleagues went out for a happy hour to celebrate reaching their goals. And Jake always got super pissed that she went. He said a woman in a serious relationship should not go out with men from work because the men might get the wrong impression. And he accused her of flirting with the men she worked with. But Rosie said she wouldn't put up with that. So she argued with Jake about it. She gave him all sorts of examples as to why he should trust her. And she pointed out that he went out with his work friends too. So Rosie asked, why was it okay for him, but not for her? He simply said that there was a difference between what's okay for men and what's okay for women. She decided she would not put up with that kind of attitude from him. So she went out with her work friends a few times a year and hunkered down when Jake made snide comments. And the odd thing was that Rosie never complained to Jake about who he was friends with and how he spent his time. And recently, she thought that Jake seemed a little too interested in one of his female Facebook friends. It was somebody he had dated a few years ago. Apparently, they'd reconnected. Jake said, she's just a friend. But something seemed fishy to Rosie. So she decided to keep an eye on the situation. One night, they were sitting on the couch, and she saw a heart emoji on one of Jake's texts. Somebody sent it to him. And he seemed very entertained by whatever conversation he was having. When she asked him about it, Jake just said, you're seeing things. When she asked to see his phone, he said, you're nuts. I'm not going to subject myself to interrogation. He insisted she was seeing things. So she figured maybe it was just a text from his mom or something and nothing to worry about. Plus, she told herself that everybody is entitled to privacy. But there was one thing that was worrying her. She didn't feel as close to Jake as she wanted to. She loved getting to know him, you know, his hopes and dreams. She liked hearing stuff from his past that shaped who he is. But she noticed that when she tried to reveal herself to him, he didn't seem interested in some of it. He was super sensitive about what he wanted to hear about. 
Like the time he got super pissed when she told a story at a party, they were with good friends playing a board game that was kind of like truth or dare. She told a truth about losing her virginity. It was one of her favorite stories because, because there was loud farting involved. She got peals of laughter every time she told it, and she loved looking back at her life and laughing. But as soon as she told the truth of the story during the game, Jake changed. He mentally withdrew from the game and became sullen. On the ride home, he gave her the silent treatment. Then when they got back to her place, he went into a tirade about never wanting to hear anything from her past when sex was involved. He said it was rude and that no man ever wants to hear anything sexual his woman has done in the past. So that's the way it went. Rosie walked on eggshells about what she could reveal to Jake. And then it happened. In fact, you may have already predicted what was going to happen. Jake dumped Rosie. He had another woman waiting in the wings. He said he didn't know why she was so surprised. He explained that he never meant to be exclusive with Rosie and that she knew that and was just trying to make him look bad by blaming him. And that, my friends, was the best thing that ever happened to Rosie. Because after that, she vowed she would do things differently. She knew there was another way. She discovered something about herself she didn't like. She came up with a name for herself, Rosie Red Flags. Yes, Rosie Red Flags, AKA women who see warning signs right in front of them, but ignore them. They make excuses, look away, pretend they don't see. And Rosie decided she was going to stop living that way. And she did. She learned the skills she needed to avoid wasting time with a frog. So why am I telling you this? It's because many of you are looking at the past, thinking your ex was a horrible person who did things to you. So now you worry that's just the way it goes. Men do bad things and women suffer. And some of you think that you won't be able to spot red flags in the future. Some of you don't even trust yourself enough to start dating. The world of men and dating seems daunting. And some of you know you ignored red flags, but you're not sure how to handle red flags in the future. And guess what? You're right. Figuring out how to handle red flags is hard for most women. That's why so many women ignore them. Many women just haven't learned how to do it. They just haven't learned what to do. They don't know they are entitled to everlasting love. Many women just don't think they can get it, but you can. And like I said before, it's not brain surgery. It's simply something you haven't mastered yet. So I invite you to work with me. I was a huge rosy red flags in the past. Not anymore. If I can do it, you can do it. And best of all, working with me is risk-free. The introductory session is free. You tell me what the problem is, and I give you a diagnosis of the main issue. And then I coach you. And if you don't like it, I'll give you a full refund of the first month. Yes, I am a coach with a money back guarantee. If you want everlasting love, sign up for a free session at therebuildingcoach.com. See you soon. This is Dawn Zigger, Love After Divorce. See ya.